He said, the nurse has filed a complaint with a nursing supervisor that you violated a Massachusetts law by hypnotizing a minor without parental consent. And I thought, you know, oh, that's nice. You know, I doubt there is a law like this. So the intern says, you're gonna have to stop doing this with her. And I said, why? He said, it's dangerous. I said, you're gonna give her general anesthesia and put her on steroids and talking to her is dangerous, you know? He said, well, you'll have to do it. And I said, I'll tell you what, take me off the case if you want, but I'm not gonna tell a patient of mine anything I know is not true. In this video, we get to hear Dr. David Spiegel. He's a medical doctor and the Associate Chair of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He's also the Director of the Center on Stress and Health and Director of the Center for Integrative Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Spiegel has more than 40 years of clinical and research experience with hypnosis, stress physiology, and psychotherapy. And in this video, we get to hear him tell the hypnosis story that might have been illegal, OMG, and also how hypnosis can change the brain as he walks us through some of the neurobiology of being in a hypnotic trance. And he also shares his self-hypnosis strategy for falling asleep fast. And so when I uh, went to medical school, I figured I'll take a course. It was Tom Hackett, who was a chair of psychiatry at Mass General, was teaching it. It was a very interesting course. And the day that converted me was um, I was doing my rotation at Children's Hospital in Boston, and the nurse is telling me, uh, Spiegel, your next patient is an asthmatic in room 437 or something. And I'm just following the sound of the wheezes down the hall. I go in the room. This is 16-year-old girl, knuckles white, bolt upright in bed, struggling for breath. You can hear the wheezing. She twice had subcutaneous epinephrine, didn't work. They were thinking about general anesthesia and starting her on steroids. And her mother's there uh, crying. And um, I said, I don't know what else to do. So I said, you want to learn a breathing exercise? And she nods. And um, I got her hypnotized. And then I realized we hadn't gotten to asthma in the course yet. So I made up something very complex. I said, each breath you take will be a little deeper and a little easier. And within five minutes, she's lying back in bed. Her knuckles aren't white. She's not wheezing. Her mother stopped crying. The nurse ran out of the room. And the intern, my intern, comes to find me. And I figure he's going to pat me on the back and say, nice job, Spiegel. He said, the nurse has filed a complaint with the nursing supervisor that you violated a Massachusetts law by hypnotizing a minor without parental consent. And I thought, you know, oh, well, that's nice. You know, I doubt there is a law like this. So the intern says, you're going to have to stop doing this with her. And I said, why? He said, it's dangerous. I said, you're going to give her general anesthesia and put her on steroids and talking to her is dangerous, you know? He said, well, you'll have to do it. And I said, I'll tell you what, take me off the case if you want, but I'm not going to tell a patient of mine anything I know is not true. So there was a battle over the weekend about what to do. And the, the intern, the chief resident, the attending, were all arguing about it. And on Monday, they came back with a radical idea. They said, let's ask the patient. I don't think this has ever been done at Children's Hospital before. And she said, oh, I like this, you know. She'd been hospitalized every month for three months in status asthmaticus. She did have one subsequent hospitalization, but after that went on to study to be a respiratory therapist. And I thought that anything that can help a patient that much violate a non-existent Massachusetts law, frustrate the nursing supervisor had to be worth looking into. So. I just kept doing it. I discovered that there were, you know, every, all of my classmates in medical school had just read the new issue of the New England Journal and had some new medication to suggest. And I would, you know, surgeons would say, look, if you can help this guy with his pain or his anxiety, anything above the neck, that's yours, do it, Spiegel. So, you know, I was having fun and being able to learn how to help people in a way that just otherwise was not being done. And so it got me thinking about the fact that, you know, we're born with this brain, but we don't have a user's manual for it. And we don't use it nearly as well as we can. And that's something your research is all about, too. And, and so I thought, I want to I understand this better, and I want to see what we can do. Stage hypnotists drive me nuts. You know, they, they make fools out of people. Um, there was one, um, my, my, this is a case my father was involved. He got a call from, he was at Columbia. He got a call, Spiegel, you got to come see this woman. She's in the ER and she's uh, in some kind of weird upset state that um, happened. And it turned out she'd been on the show with a stage hypnotist um, who, and what they do, by the way, is they, they cycle around. You know, they have a, the beginning of the show, they don't just grab somebody and say, we're doing this. They get a bunch of people up. They do what amounts to hypnotizability testing to see if people, and they, they get the ones who are the most hypnotizable. So she was the one 
And he said, there's now uh, a little bird in your hand and you're going to play with the bird. And she starts to cry and scream. And uh, he just gets her off the stage because it's very upsetting. And she's wandering around New York City in the middle of the night, dissociated, and brought to Columbia. And that's where my father saw her. She was still in a kind of uncomfortable trance-like state. And it turned out that she was the trophy wife of a very wealthy guy. And she felt like a bird in a gilded cage. And so to her, that image just triggered all of this sense of dissatisfaction, discomfort, fear about her life. And he was able to get her reoriented and talk with her about what she was going to do with her life. But I don't like stage hypnosis. You're making fools out of people. Um, and you're using the fact, and that's what scares people about hypnosis. They think you're losing control. You're gaining control. Self-hypnosis is a way of enhancing your control over your mind and your body. It can work very well. But because it gives you a kind of cognitive flexibility, you're able to shift sets very easily, to give up judging and evaluating the way you usually do and see something from a different point of view. That's a great therapeutic opportunity, but if misused, it could be a danger too. And that's what scares people about it. It's, it is that very ability to suspend critical judgment and just have an experience and see what happens. That can be a great therapeutic opportunity, but if somebody's misusing it, it can be a way to harm people. And you know, there are plenty of examples of people having fantasies imposed on them that they come to think are realities. It's not unusual these days. So um, it's, it's an ability that if people learn to recognize and understand it, can be a tremendous therapeutic tool. We uh, did a study where we selected highly and non-hypnotizable people so we could do the comparison and then hypnotize them in the functional MRI scanner. And we found three things characterize the entry into the hypnotic state. The first is turning down activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. So the DACC is in the central front middle part of the brain, as you, you well know. And it's, it's part of what we call the salience network. Uh, it's a, a conflict detector. So if you're, you know, uh, engaged in work and you hear a loud noise that you think might be a gunshot, that's your anterior cingulate cortex saying, hey, wait a minute, there's a potential danger over there. You better pay attention to it. So... It's a, it compares what you're doing with what else is going on and helps you decide what to do. And as you can imagine, uh, turning down activity in that region make it less likely that you'll be distracted and pulled out of whatever you're in. And in another study, we found that highly hypnotizable people, even without being hypnotized, have more functional connectivity between the DACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so, which is part of the, a key region in the executive control network. So when you're engaging in tasks, you're enacting a plan, you're writing a paper, you're doing whatever you're doing, that's the, the prefrontal cortex is doing that. And so if that is coordinated, we found more functional connect, uh, connectivity. So when one is up, the other's up, when one is down, the other's down, that coordination implies that the brain is saying, okay, go ahead. I know what you're doing. Carry out that plan and don't worry about other possibilities. So two other things happen when people are hypnotized. One is that that DLPFC has higher functional connectivity with the insula, another part of the salience network. It's a part of the mind-body control system, sensitive to what's happening in the body. It's part of the pain network as well. But it's also a region of the brain where you can control things in your body that you wouldn't think you could. For example, we did a study years ago where we took people uh, who were highly hypnotizable, hypnotized them and told them to imagine, we went on an imaginary culinary tour. So um, we would, they would eat their favorite foods and we found that they increased their gastric acid secretion like by 87%. So their stomach was acting as though it was about to get, I mean, there was one woman, it was so vivid for her that halfway through she said, let's stop, I'm full. You know, <laughs> then we got them to relax and think of anything but food or drink. And we got like a 40% decrease in gastric acid secretion. So they could, and that was DLPFC through the insula telling the stomach, you're getting food or you're not getting food. And even we injected them with pentagastrin, which triggers gastric acid release. And even then in the hypnosis condition, they had a 19% reduction in gastric acid. So the brain has this amazing ability to control what's going on in the body in ways that we don't think we have ability to control. That's just... One example. So that's the DLPFC insulate connection. 
The third thing that happens, and this relates to what you did on the stage, is you have inverse functional connectivity between the DLPFC and the posterior cingulate cortex. The posterior cingulate uh, is part of the default mode network. It's in the back of the brain. Um, and it's, it's an, an area whose activity goes down, for example, in meditators. And in meditation, you're supposed to be selfless. You're supposed to, the self is an illusion. You're supposed to let it dissolve and just experience things. And when you're doing that, the posterior thing that is decreasing in activity. The inverse connection is I'm doing something, but I'm not thinking about what it means for me. I may not even remember much of it. If I do, I don't care that much about it. And so that is part of the dissociation that occurs with hypnosis. So it's how you put things outside of conscious awareness and don't worry about what it means. It also adds to cognitive flexibility. You know, if you're thinking, well, people like me don't usually do this, that may inhibit you from enacting a new form of psychotherapy, for example, that you've never done before. Um, but if you're ha having this decreased activity in the part of your brain that reflects on what it means, um, you're more likely to be cognitively flexible and willing to give it a try. And that's one of the therapeutic advantages of hypnosis as well. Hypnosis is very good as a problem focused uh, treatment. Um, it's really, it's the oldest Western conception of a psychotherapy, and it can be used for specific problems in a way that's very helpful. Uh, we found it very helpful for stress reduction, um, for helping people deal, we're all dealing with stress these days. Um, and it's helpful, that mind-body connection is very helpful because um, part of the problem with stress is your perception. You mentioned it earlier in a sort of good sense, you're at a, you know, a football game or something, and you feel the physical reaction, that can be a reinforcing thing. Wow, this is exciting, let's do it. It can also be very distracting. So you're worried about getting COVID or you're worried about um, some other physical problem you have and you, you notice it in your body. Your body tenses up, uh, you start to sweat, the sympathetic nervous system goes, your heart rate goes up. And when you notice that, you think, oh God, this is really bad. And then you feel worse. So it's like a snowball rolling downhill. Uh, and, and then you feel worse and then your body gets worse. Hypnosis can be very helpful in s dissociating somatic reaction from psychological reaction. So we teach people to imagine their body floating somewhere safe and comfortable, like a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or floating in space. And then picture the problem that they're, that's stressing them on an imaginary screen with the rule that no matter what you see on the screen, you keep your body comfortable. So at this point, you, can't, you still can't control the stress, but you can control your physical reaction to it. And that starts you feeling more in control. At least there's one thing I can manage. And then you can use it to think through or visualize through one thing you might do about that stressor. So hypnosis is very helpful in controlling mind-body interaction in relation to stress. Um, it's very helpful for people to get to sleep. Uh, we're having a lot of fun with that. I, I'm getting emails from people who said, you know, I haven't slept right in 15 years, and now for the first time, um, you know, I'm listening to your app, and I can sleep at night. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, I, I, I tell people, don't look at the clock. That's an arousal cue. You know, you'll just you'll wake up more. Um, but a mad picture whatever you're thinking about or worrying about on that imaginary screen while your body's floating. So watch your own movie but keep your body floating. And many people can use that to get back to sleep.